from the world as the seas which they kept open to peaceful commerce, there emerged from the air dock at Wingfoot Lake one of the vessels designed to make that warning effective. This was not battleship or cruiser, but a non-rigid airship, the Navy K-3, largest ever built in America. It will be assigned to patrol duty along the seacoast against the threat of mines and submarines. Easily, gracefully, the K-3 moves out for its first trial flight, and only a small ground crew is on hand as the mobile mast, mounted on huge Goodyear tires, holds it securely against cross-hanger winds. Mr. Litchfield, taking part in this first flight, talks to commanders Watson and Knox of the United States Navy. Now the lever is thrown, the mast backs way, the ship is in the air, airborne in the Navy phrase. On active duty, the patrol airship will carry bombs and machine guns, can give stout account of itself, but primarily it's a scout, one which can fly in all weathers, see deep, search thoroughly against any enemies who menace our shipping or our men of war. In the long line of defense materials, parts for airplanes, powder for the big guns, tires for combat cars and gun carriages and the rest, there is still nothing quite so dramatic, quite so thrilling as the airship, for it's distinctively Goodyear, product of our pioneering, of our own perfecting, of our abiding faith. And now let's go out to Arizona near Phoenix, where another airplane parts plant is being erected on the great desert which Goodyear found 25 years ago could be amazingly productive once irrigation was applied for cotton and citrus fruit. Arizona now moves forward to take on a key role in industry as well. With the driving speed and determination of a nation aroused, girders are being rushed to Litchfield Park at the edge of the plantation. Steam hoists are lifting them out of railroad cars, carrying them to position. Men scramble aloft, and the rat-a-tat-tat of the riveter's air hammer roars over the vast area where for thousands of years there was no sound, no people lived, where only sagebrush and mesquite grew and only the jackrabbit and the prairie dog could make a living. Located between the huge airplane plants of California, which the factory will serve, and the broad flying fields of Texas, Goodyear, Arizona is writing a new saga of American enterprise. The plant is well along toward completion by now, and by the first of the year will be moving into production of parts for bombers and fighter planes, supplementing the work of the big plant at Akron. Previous newsreels have shown you pictures of barrage balloons, which, flown from anchored cables at heights of 7,000 feet and higher, make enemy airplanes keep their distance. Goodyear is building these balloons at Akron and New Bedford, Massachusetts. Let's see how they're made. Here is the famous Goodyear gym, largest in the state of Ohio, scene of many a hard-fought basketball game, the annual Christmas party, and other events. But the gym is in the Army now and commandeered for defense uses. Today, it's barrage balloons, and pretty girls in khaki slacks are fitting together the hundreds of curiously shaped patterns of rubberized fabric, cementing them into place. You might wonder whether these pieces will fit together at the end, but they always do. Below the rolling hills near Adena, Ohio, is located Goodyear's coal mine. There, rubber built into rugged tires and stout belts is helping today to produce coal and so provide power for defense. The miner's lamp is an electric light now, off a battery. It's set in a helmet, in case you hit your head against a low ceiling, and is insulated against electrical shock. The dispatcher gives the go signal, and off go the miners on their five-mile journey into the bowels of the earth. Goodyear took over this mine in 1917 to meet the emergencies of war, and today, in another war emergency, this mine becomes highly useful. Here we are at the scene of operations. The power drill cuts deep into the coal and the slate above. Due to modern methods, the need for pick and shovel has been discarded. All right, we're all ready. The charge is wired up and tamped into place and an electric contact sets off the powder, brings down the coal. Crab-like steel claws draw the coal into the loading machine where conveyors carry it back and through, dump it into rubber-tired buggies, shoving and pushing it along until the buggy is full. This huge car, which all but fills the entryway, needs no tracks. It picks up its load, swings around corners, moves on. Another dramatic new use for rubber. But not the last. 
For now the driver pulls a lever and dumps the load of coal onto a moving Goodyear belt, which will carry it to the dispatching point. The old mine mule of song and story must be breathing a sigh of relief now as she goes off the graves, leaving a rubber belt to do the work. The belt can be moved from one place to another, extended deeper as operations proceed. At the end of the line, the belt carries the coal over a pulley, dumps it into a chute, which in turn fills up the coal cars one after another as they pass underneath. And now with the coal on its way, Let's take time out for lunch from huge double-decker lunch pails. And this is the story of modern coal mining at the Goodyear mine, typical of progressive operations, where machinery is used to undercut the coal, to drill it, to load it, and haul it away, saving a million backaches for the men who produce this essential resource. More familiar to everyone are the tipple operations. There the coal is screened and graded, plate or foreign material removed. Two train loads daily leave the mine to become the black corpuscles in the lifeblood of industry. We come to the end of the day. The cars pull out of the mine and the men hurry up the hill to the showers with the day's accumulation of coal dust. You'd think this chap would never get clean, but he'll emerge presently, smiling, ready to carry on. Another of the mighty clan of Goodyear folk bound together more closely than ever in these stressful days. And here he is. Nice work, son. Next, we take you south to the Gadsden plant, which you see in back. It's Saturday afternoon, and a group of employees are casting in practice for the fishing season. Arch Verick, formerly of Plant 2 Akron, checks their scores against the target and then tries a couple of casts himself. This attractive lake was built by the employees themselves by damming up a swamp back of the plant. Everybody put on rubber boots after working hours, helped to create this artificial lake. It's a beauty spot and well stocked with fish. No wonder they're proud of it. And here are the woods back of the dam. The whole swamp was as dense as that when they started. Here come Al Michaels, Rurick, and Craig Miles across the dam with Jim Work and his boy. The Dixie plant boasts a cross-handed golfer in Norm Niger, and a left-handed one in McBride. Here's Jones of Engineering with the blimp hanger in the background. Employees built this golf course also alongside the plant. This girl's husband works in the factory. Griffin, old-time Akron squad man, takes a practice swing and walks right into the camera. Marilyn Michaels, Al's pretty daughter, will be ready to challenge her father before long. Bob Goodall drives one to the tricky hole by the river. It's really a beautiful course. A tournament is wound up on the 18th hole back of the clubhouse. And Frank sets a Goodyear balloon, or rather half a balloon, is used as a mold or form in building houses in Washington, D.C. They simply inflate the bag, spray quick-drying concrete on it, put some wire netting over for reinforcement, and spray on more concrete. The mixing is done in the nozzle of the spray gun, and the houses can be built at the rate of 100 every 60 days, using only four balloons. Frames for doors and windows are placed in position at the start, and connecting walls and internal partitions for rooms and closets are built in afterward. As soon as the main building is done, the balloon is deflated and removed, taken on to the next job. And here is one of the complete houses open for inspection. The buildings are attractive, can be built in a number of architectural types. These balloon houses are attracting wide attention. The Army and Navy visit Goodyear the same week. Here's the Army crossing the street with Tommy Tompkinson as guide. They're headed for Goodyear Hall, where General McFarland, Assistant Chief of Ordnance, talked to 1,800 employees, girls from the balloon room, men from mills and calendars, office and factory people. On that day, America was still at peace. Not yet had we been shocked by the news from Pearl Harbor. The general, however, told Goodyear people what might happen and told them how vital to the defense of America was Goodyear's production in Akron and outside. Ask them to carry on. And here's the Navy. Admiral Towers, chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics, lands at Akron Airport 
where he is met by Vice President Jack Linforth of Goodyear and Commander Knox of the Navy, who present members of the Goodyear Party. A newspaper cameraman moves in to ask Mr. Litchfield and the Admiral to shake hands all over again for the evening paper. Akron is an important producer of Navy materiel, and that's why the top-ranking Air Admiral was here. Gene Judd introduces a press man, then Zeno Wicks and Rusty Young lead the way to the big dock. President Eddie Thomas shows the visitor some of the parts Goodyear Aircraft is building for long-range patrol bombers and fighting ships, which the Navy is using over two oceans now. The Admiral has one last message for Commander Knox, Inspector of Naval Aircraft here. Keep them rolling, he says. Eddie Thomas, Bob Wilson, and Cliff Slusser look over the new tire which startled the country recently, one made from reclaimed rubber, which will save precious new rubber for more urgent defense needs. See the bees which form the tread? A victory tire. The official name is regenerated rubber. The tire shouldn't be driven at high speeds, but will help fill the gap during these war days. Provide thousands of tires without drawing on America's stockpile. It's okay, says Bob Wilson. A beloved institution at Goodyear Aquin for years has been the annual Christmas party for the children. And here's a typical scene taken last year. But defense has come in, and the hall is needed for other purposes. Last month, it was full of barrage balloons. Today, they're building attack boats there for troop movements over water. <laughs> First consideration, that obligation extends more than halfway around the world to the Netherlands East Indies. It has grown the rubber that Uncle Sam needs. But what if this vital source was cut off and denied us? Would our vast and virile defense machine falter for lack of the precious product of the Indies? When Goodyear promised every facility, they'd already solved this problem in their laboratory. Synthetic rubber, manufactured by a Latter-day Alchemy from oil and other native resources, has been devised and tested. Called a chemi gum, it commands virtually all of the characteristics of natural rubber and is in some respects superior. But success is not satisfaction to Goodyear, who is building an entire new plant to be devoted to the further research, refinement, and production of chemi gum. Science stands next to industry on the firing line. Goodyear's record of more than two decades of association with lighter than aircraft has been honored by the recent contract for six such craft for the United States Navy. Designed for offshore patrol duty, these non-rigid ships can cruise at great heights over coastal areas, maintaining constant watch for hostile vessels above or below the surface. Even before England was attacked, Goodyear was experimenting with the theory of the barrage balloon. Today, the experiments are ahead even of Britain's practical application. A spider web of steel cables hung from captive balloons forces a bomber to fly high over his target and keeps him from diving. Cables from a number of these balloons placed about an objective can crumble an unwary bomber like cheese through a grater. Goodyear pioneered the development of special airplane tires to help prevent ground looping. Along with this early contribution has come the added refinements that enable our huge flying fortresses to land and take off with ease and safety. Thanks to the industry, our air army needs no velvet runways to carry out its mission. Goodyear, seeing the necessity for cooperation and speed, has turned this huge air dock into an airplane parts factory. With the experience their craftsmen have had in the fabrication of light alloy parts for dirigibles, they turn their specialized training to the production of tail surfaces, ailerons and rudders for fighting planes. Acting as subcontractor for the Glen L. Martin Company and other leading manufacturers of bombers, Goodyear is helping to guarantee that the Eagle has fallen. Flotation 
gear installed in the wings will sustain a plane that's forced to land in water, while instant inflation is also a feature of the life raft for pilots who find themselves in similar circumstances. With these Goodyear safety devices, both plane and pilot, who might ordinarily be casualties in battle, can be restored to flight and fight. Goodyear has been supplying wheel rubber ever since the automobile was being made with whip sockets on the dashboard. And so the increased use of the motor vehicle in the national defense program has called for little readjustment in Akron. However, Goodyear has contributed a solution to the greatest problem of the high-speed motorized column, the flat tire. Special self-seating tubes for motorcycles, trucks, scout cars, troop and gun carriers and other light vehicles have been developed by Goodyear that will withstand even the puncture of a rifle bullet and yet permit the vehicle to continue to the completion of its mission. Although the point of penetration is almost invisible, it is the fast self-sealing action of the rubber tube which prevents a leakage of no more than five pounds of pressure from the tire. Mechanized Blitzkrieg has thrown sudden responsibilities on the tank. The ponderous old dry land dreadnought of yesterday has been streamlined to the military necessity of tomorrow. When the metal caterpillar treads are removed and replaced by rubber, the tank becomes lighter, faster and tractable on more tight terrain than ever before. It is Goodyear's privilege to be able to manufacture the rubber treads that make American tanks the best reason why we'll never need a Maginot line. War has not yet reached the ultimate refinements of degradation to which it has been known to sink. But when and if it does, the first chemical invasion of America is being repelled today in the Goodyear plant, where gas masks and respirators are made and assembled. These are Goodyear's tasks, and this is her pride. For Goodyear has shouldered arms and marches along with America and the defense of America. For rubber is as much a part of national defense as steel or copper or tin 